Hi everyone, I'm back today with a video I've been meaning to update for quite a while now. Today I'll take you through building your own AllSky camera. The AllSky project I'll cover in this video uses free software downloadable from GitHub at this location on the screen now, which I'll also post in the video description. As always, please like the video if you find it helpful, subscribe to the channel, and share it with others. As far as this video goes, I suggest watching all the way through so you can get an understanding of the process, but you can also jump around by using the YouTube Chapters feature. This particular project minimally requires Raspberry Pi hardware like this, a micro SD card, a lens with a wide field of view, and a camera, which if you follow my other astrophotography work, you may already own. Maybe you want a 24-7, 365, permanently mounted camera view of the sky at a specific location, or maybe you just want to drag it out on a tripod occasionally to monitor your own astrophotography imaging sessions. For me, most of the time I just drag mine out on a tripod alongside my telescope so I can monitor my sky conditions throughout the evening. I also use it to create some pretty cool time lapses and keygrams of the previous night. These time lapses and keygrams can be really helpful when I'm trying to understand why my telescope wasn't acting the way I expected it to. If nothing else, it lets me create some fun videos that I can share with others. For me, I see lots of aircraft approaching Atlanta, and occasionally I'll get some meteors. I also choose to share my live all sky feeds with my website at this address below. To give you an example of how I use this, here's a time lapse from the other night. The weather forecast said it was supposed to be clear, but the next day I noticed several of my saved images told me otherwise. So I looked through the video, and yep, clouds rolled on through a couple times. The keyogram can also be helpful for this as well. A keyogram grabs a single pixel width line from the top center of each captured image to the bottom center of that image. It then attaches all of these lines from left to right to create a new picture called a keyogram. This represents the entire night. So looking at this keyogram, I can see that it started okay. The moon was overhead here just before midnight. Then we got some clouds around here just after midnight. Then it cleared up around 2.30 but then got cloudy again around four with a short break in the clouds before they came back in again around 5 a.m. You can even see some light clouds back here between three and 4 a.m. I'm gonna overlay the keyogram on the time lapse in a second so you can see how this works together. Remember, the beginning of the evening is on the left and the end of the night is on the right. North or the top of my time lapse video is up here and south is at the bottom. See, the keyogram is the fastest way to visually get a feel for an entire evening. Think any of this could be helpful to you? Or you just like the real-time view or time lapses? Either way, stick around and I'll help you get one set up. Before we get started, let's talk about the minimum hardware needs for this project. First, the Raspberry Pi. This AllSky software will work on the Pi Zero, Two, Three, and Four. My recommendation is to get a Pi Four with eight gig of RAM, but a Pi Three or Pi Four with four gig of RAM should work just as well. But let's discuss what I mean by works and why I'm not leaning into the Pi Zero as a cheaper alternative. The AllSky software has a couple functions. First and most importantly, it needs to capture images at regular intervals and store that data. Any of the Pi hardware from zero to four can do this more or less without issue. The next thing you'd like to do is publish those images either locally or online. The various Pi hardware solutions can all likely pull that off as well, but running a web server locally does add some additional stress to the lower end models. Okay, now let's get into the biggest likely problem area. At the end of each night, the solution tries to take every saved image from the previous night and create time lapses, keyograms, and star trail images. The lower end Pi solutions will almost definitely fail when trying to perform these functions. It's a combination of lower processing power and not enough memory. That's the real issue here. Even the four gig models will likely need some amount of tweaking in the form of downsizing your images, managing operating system swap files, etc. If you're not an OS guru and just want an all sky camera that works, get the latest Pi 4 8 gig model. I'll put some links in the description of this video for hardware that I chose to use. These are all affiliate links and I'll get some level of compensation if you click on the links before you purchase anything, but don't feel like you need to do that. If you see better pricing somewhere else, go for it. I would too. I'll mention more details about the Pi hardware when we get into the build portion of this video. 
With the Pi hardware, the OS runs from a micro SD card. While I find that 128 gig or 256 gig is a good sweet spot and gives me tons of historical storage, but 32 or 64 gig can work as well. I'm sure you may even be able to go a bit lower than that if you need to. The last thing I personally want to do is fight with storage and running out of disk space, so I try to start at 128 if I can. Okay, next, you need a camera. This software is designed to use either a ZWO camera or a Raspberry Pi HQ camera. The Pi HQ camera is less expensive, but you may see better performance from some of the ZWO cameras. Plus, they'll likely be easier to configure and get running. As a side note, some of you may already have an extra ZWO camera sitting around. Maybe that camera you use for planetary imaging is just gathering dust right now. Why not put it to work on its day off? If you don't have one sitting around, even a lower-end ASI 120 can do the trick. Okay, so now we have a Raspberry Pi, a disk for the operating system and storage, and a camera, but don't forget the lens. There are several options here. Do some digging and get something that's gonna work with your camera. ZWO makes some of their own fisheye-style lenses that are specific to the camera models and work with either C or CS mount cameras. There are several other options available, especially for the Pi HQ cameras. Everything from narrow field lenses to 180 or even 220 degree field of view lenses. There are many options available from your typical telescope hardware distributor, Raspberry Pi shops online, and even Amazon. Now that you know what hardware you need, let's get to the operating system and get our Raspberry Pi running. Once here, find the link for Raspberry Pi Imager, download and install it. I'm gonna do it on my Mac, but you can also do this on Windows, Linux, and even a Raspberry Pi itself if you already have one running. Once it's installed, launch the Raspberry Pi Imager application. Click Choose OS. There are several options here, and while you could select the recommended 32-bit Bullseye OS with the Raspberry Pi desktop included, I'm gonna suggest you don't do that, especially if you plan on running this on a Raspberry Pi system with less RAM. Running the desktop is going to consume computing power you don't have to spare. My suggestion is to click Raspberry Pi OS Other, then select Raspberry Pi OS Lite 32-bit. Now click Choose Storage. At this point, you should have your micro SD card inserted in your computer. You may need to use an SD card adapter to connect to your computer. Okay, now stop what you're doing at this point. You need to select the right card from the list. Don't make a mistake and overwrite your hard drive or your attached USB storage that has all of your family photos on it. Pay attention and get this right. Now that we've selected the OS and target drive, we should do some pre-configuration to make our life a lot easier moving forward. Click on the gear icon over here. We can force some parameters into the operating system to save us some time. Let's leave the host name for now. We're gonna do that later through the AllSky installer but I do want you to enable SSH and set a password. I'll leave the default username of Pi here in this process. I'll also preset my Wi-Fi info by adding the SSID and password it should use to connect. Wireless LAN country defaults to Great Britain, so I'll set mine to United States, and I'll also force the locale based on my time zone and keyboard layout. I'll double check everything one more time, then click Save. Now I can click right and then yes to continue. On my Mac, I'm prompted one more time, but your OS may differ here. Now it'll go ahead and image the micro SD card as requested. Once done, I can close the app and remove the card from the computer. Let's put this card aside for a bit while I take you through building a Raspberry Pi 4 for those of you that are new to this. Depending on what you purchased, your packaging may vary. Maybe you bought individual parts or a kit. Either way, it should look very similar. This is a boxed Pi 4B with 8 gig of RAM. If you haven't used a Pi 4B before, you might be surprised by what it includes in such a small package. Let's run through that. First, things you should recognize. Two USB 2.0 ports, two USB 3.0 ports, and a gigabit ethernet port. Over here, we have the USB-C power port, which expects five volt at three amp. Next to that, we have two micro HDMI ports, the one nearest the power port is the primary port. So if you plan on connecting a monitor, this is where you'll connect it. This here is a four pole, 3.5 millimeter audio and composite video port. There are also two ribbon style connection ports. This one here is a CSI camera connector where you would connect your Pi HQ camera if that's what you plan on using. This ribbon port over here is for a DSI display connection as an alternative to HDMI. If you use a small touchscreen or something similar to that, this may be how you connect it. 
The way I'm going to take you through the install, you aren't going to need a local screen at all, not even HDMI. If you're wondering what all these pins are up here, this is called the GPIO header. We're only going to use it for powering a small fan in our case, but there's lots of other peripherals you could connect to a Pi. Numerous gadgets and sensors are available, but that's another topic entirely. Over here, these pins are for your PoE header. If you want to use power over Ethernet, you would add a PoE hat to the solution. And finally, just so you can say you know what everything here is called, this is your Wi-Fi and Bluetooth module, this is your Broadcom CPU, this here is your LPDDR4 SD RAM, and over here is your USB 3 controller. This last chip is the Gigabit controller. Oh, and just when you thought we were done, flipping it over reveals the micro SD card slot, but don't put your card in just yet. So that was the Pi 4B itself, but you probably don't want to leave it just hanging out in the open. They make a bunch of enclosures. They're all pretty similar, so I'll take you through installing it into this one here. This case comes apart into multiple pieces. To start, we just need the base. Place the card into the base, and using the four mounting screws that come with the kit, screw them in here, 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 and here. Do not install the micro SD card until the case is completely assembled. If you put it in before mounting it in the case, it's very easy to damage the card. Please don't ask me how I know this. Next, your kit likely came with some heat sinks to regulate the temperature on the chips. You'll either get three or four depending on your kit. Remove the backing from each and stick them onto the correct chips based on the sizes provided. This particular kit has a secondary tier to the case that installs next, so I'll stack that on top of the base, making sure it seats properly around the ports. Next, I'll mount the fan to the lid using the screws provided. Your kit may not come with a fan, but since this is likely an outdoor application, I would suggest you find one that does. You have a few options when connecting this style fan for power. I suggest looking at your install guide, but as a general rule, they'll tell you you can choose between running the fan in either high or low speed mode. Both options require connecting the black lead to a grounding pin on the GPIO header. There will be a couple grounding pins you can choose from, but I'll choose the seventh pin over here because of how this particular case is built. Now for the positive red fan lead, you'll choose either the 3.3 volt for low speed applications or a 5 volt lead for high speed mode. I'm going to choose to use the fan in high speed mode in this particular case. Once connected, close up the case and flip it over to reveal the micro SD card slot. You can go ahead and install the card into the case now. Okay, at this point, we're almost ready to boot up, but I'm gonna suggest you connect your camera first. Here I have one of my older Raspberry Pi 4s with a USB cable attached for my ZWO camera. This is obviously a pretty straightforward install. If you plan on using a Pi HQ, make sure you get a case that supports it. You'll see why in a second when we look at the ribbon connector that's required. All right, here's the camera ribbon connection port. It's between the audio port and the secondary HDMI port. It may be difficult to see here, but the ribbon cable port is currently closed with the black plastic edge pressed downward. If we look at this image, I've pulled up the plastic ribbon lock. It needs to be open like this before you try to install the ribbon cable, or it's very likely you'll damage the cable. Let me toggle back and forth here for a second so you can try to see what it looks like when the ribbon cable connector is open and closed. Now we can install one end of the ribbon cable. These ribbon cables have silver ends of the wire that are exposed only on one side of the ribbon. The other side is often solid or has some tape affixed. With the exposed metal leads facing the HDMI port side of the connector, slide the ribbon cable into the connector. Once the cable is seated, we can close the ribbon lock on the port by pressing it back downward. Be careful with the cable during this process. Now we can look at the Pi HQ camera. Here is the back of that camera. You can see the same type of ribbon connector here on the end closest to us. The ribbon lock is closed, so we need to open it up like before. Once open, we can install the other end of the ribbon cable. On this end of the connection, make sure that the exposed metal leads are facing downward towards the board on the camera. Once installed, lock the cable in place. The HQ camera has a quarter of an inch threaded tripod connector built in, so I'll just screw that onto a tripod for testing. You can see I'm using a 180 degree fisheye style lens as well. My Pi 4B is just dangling by the ribbon cable. Now this isn't ideal, but I'll be careful during the testing and it should be okay until I sort out how I want to permanently mount this. Now I'll attach the power cable to the USB-C port. And if you want or need to, you can connect an HDMI cable. If you remember, I recommended not installing the Pi desktop OS version and instead enabling SSH by default. 
So as long as it connects to my Wi-Fi network when it boots up, I can do everything over the network from my other computer without a monitor, keyboard, or mouse directly attached to the Pi 4B. All right, I powered it up, the lights came on as expected, the fan is running, and it's time to connect to the device and start installing AllSky. First, let's ping it by name to make sure I can see it on my home network. By default, since I didn't change the name earlier, it's raspberrypi.local. You can also choose to ping the IP address if you knew what it was by checking your home router's DHCP address list. Great, my computer can see it and see it respond. Now I'll SSH into it. Depending on your operating system, you can use the command line or download an application to make this connection. If you remember, I left the username as Pi and I set a custom password. When I connect, I'll accept the fingerprint, enter the password, and I'm in. And just like that, you're a TV show hacker. You can see my command line shows me that I'm connected. The first thing that I'll do is check for updates. Type sudo apt-get update, then when that's done, sudo apt-get upgrade, and then yes to continue. When it's done, I'll reboot with a sudo shutdown-r now. In a minute, I'll reconnect. When I reconnect, I like to do an uptime-p to help me verify that it actually did reboot. All right, let's pause the process here so I can call out a few critical points about the AllSky website. When you get to the website, there's a bunch of items on the first page, which is effectively the readme file for the project. We'll come back here, but first I want you to understand the layout of what else is available to you in case you need some help along the way. Over here is the wiki. There's a bunch of info in here that you may find helpful related to all aspects of this project. We also have an issue section that you can use to search for a problem you might be having or to create a new issue if you can't find a solution elsewhere. Please only create issues for, well, issues. If you just have a question or a feature request, that shouldn't go here. Go make those sort of comments or requests in discussions. Before opening a new issue, make sure you check the wiki and search existing issues. Also come here to discussions too, just to see if your problem has already been addressed. These locations all have information that will help you get back on the right path if you lose your way. If you can't find your answer though, and need to open a new issue, make sure you come here and follow the process completely so you can get the support you need. Understanding how to submit log files with the right debug level will be important if you hope to get a faster response. The developers are all donating their time to this project, so let's make it as easy as possible for them. Clicking back up top on code will bring us back to our original landing page. Scrolling down, we can click to open items and begin our install process. Let's go into software installation first time only. This gives us the steps we need to install AllSky. Please understand that the source of truth for this project and most up-to-date info will always be this website and wiki. This video could certainly get out of date from time to time between updates. If you see something here that doesn't match, head back to the website. While I'll be talking you through an install in this video here, I will be speeding it up so you don't have to wait through the boring parts. Okay, let's enter the commands as instructed. First, we'll check to see if Git is installed and up-to-date. Great, looks good already. Before pulling down the software, just a couple quick commands if you aren't Linux savvy. LS will list items in your current location. You can also do something like LS-LSA or LS-L to display more data about the items as well as hidden items. I won't show you it here, but the PWD command will show you your present working directory, so where you are in the system right now. And CD tilde will get you back to the original place where you started when you connected via SSH. These commands can help in case you ever get lost in the file system and you need to get back to where you started. Now this isn't meant to be a Linux course, so I'm gonna let you dig into the rest on your own. Back to the AllSky install, let's go ahead and do a git clone based on the command provided. This will pull the files down to our device. I'll just do a quick listing when it's done to show you that the AllSky directory was created and then CD AllSky as instructed. Now let's list the contents of the new AllSky folder just to see that everything's here and we can see all the new files and folders. Now we can continue our install by typing dot slash install.sh. It's important that you select your camera type now. In this particular install, I'll select ZWO and let the install continue. Okay, at the end of the install, it will prompt for a reboot. Go ahead and do that, then reconnect. And I like to check the uptime every time I reconnect, as I mentioned earlier, just to make sure it actually did reboot. Great. Come back to the AllSky page and follow along. 
The next section on the AllSky page is usage. Everything in here is pretty much for reference since the installer already sets AllSky to start automatically at boot. Let's move along, and since this is a new install and not an update, we can go straight to web user interface or web UI. And while this isn't required, I'm going to tell you that it is. Just do it. As a matter of fact, I've heard that in an upcoming release, the web UI will auto-install when AllSky installs. So depending on when you start your project, you may not even have to do this. Always check the website for updated install information. Since we did a reboot, we need to get back into the AllSky folder, so let's do a CD AllSky. Then follow along with the instructions on the web page. Of course, always use the website since this process can change. As instructed, I'll do a GUI slash install.sh. And here it asks me for a name for the AllSky box. Up until now, it's been called Raspberry Pi. We could use the default name of AllSky that's here, but since I'll be testing with more than one of these boxes on my network, and they all have to have a unique name on my home network, I'll rename mine PA-AllSky-4B, then let the web UI install complete, and then I'll let it reboot again. Now, important item here. We changed the name. This is the name we're going to use to connect from now on with SSH, the web UI, and even the public PHP imager viewer that I'll show you here shortly. Let's open the web browser and go to http colon slash slash pa-allsky-4b.local. You, of course, would use your name dot local, depending on what you called it. And then to log in, the default web UI username is admin and the default web UI password is secret. And there you go, a picture of a ceiling. Could you ask for more? You can toggle between light and dark mode. I'm gonna move it to dark mode just in case you're watching this outside while you're babysitting your telescope. We're now looking at the live view page of our camera, but this needed a login. For anyone else in the house without a login, just have them go to http colon slash slash the name of your pi dot local slash public dot php. The same image without a login. Back to the web UI, click images and we can see anything that's been saved which eventually could be a couple weeks worth of data. More importantly now though, we need to go to camera settings. This page will vary depending on which camera you installed, either ZWO or RPI HQ. One of the first things you need to do though, is get your latitude and longitude set properly. This uses north, south, east, and west nomenclature. Do not use a plus and minus sign in here. If you get this wrong, you will have issues. There's lots of settings in here. Some you'll tweak once you get it running, others you will never tweak. All these settings are documented on the website. Remember to click Save Changes after any modification. After saving, let's click System from the menu and see that we can start and stop AllSky, reboot or shut down the Pi, and even see some basic statistics. There's also the ability to change a password to reset the Web UI admin account. Configure your Wi-Fi connection, look at your WLAN or LAN connection statuses, and even an editor, which you'll use at some point. All right, we're on a roll. Right now we have AllSky installed and the web UI is also here, so we can take and view images. It isn't completely configured and fine-tuned yet, but we have a somewhat functional system. Since we're still in the mindset of installing software, let's continue with the AllSky website installation. This is basically a superior version of the public PHP page. We're gonna install it locally on this same Raspberry Pi here, but you can also choose to download it separately and install it on a public website or another box as you choose. There's more complexity to running this part of the package on an external website, so only attempt that when you're ready and feel capable. To do a local install of the AllSky website, I just go back to the main AllSky page and continue on to the next section and follow the install steps. To do that, we need to reconnect to our SSH session. And remember, this uses the Pi user account. And since we recently changed our box's name to pa-allsky-4b.local, the command needs to reflect that. Once connected, just follow the steps and cd into tilde slash allsky. Then run website slash install.sh. Notice that once the install completes, it tells us that we need to modify our ftp-settings.sh file to tell the system where to send the files. We can make these edits after installation completes via the web GUI. Quick side note, there is another tip at the end of the install script. We need to also edit config to tell it to post end of night data. All right, quick pause here. Do you like what you see so far? 
why not donate to the cause? The development team of All Sky will be happy to see it. And if you like any of my videos, feel free to use any of my affiliate links from the description of this or any of my other videos. When you make a purchase at any of those vendors after using my link, I get compensated at no cost to you. All right, enough shilling, let's get back to work. Here in the wiki, we can see the pages for the settings, descriptions, and explanations. The web UI had options to edit its files from the web page, but currently the AllSky website does not. This may change in the future. In this case, you can use a tool on the Pi at the command line called nano, and I'll type nano slash var slash www slash html slash AllSky slash config.js as instructed just above this command. Change everything obvious at this point. Oh, and hey, notice here that latitude and longitude is actually in positive and negative numbers. It doesn't use north, south, east, west notation. How do you save your edits in Nano? When you're done, click Control X, then press Y to confirm, and then Enter to overwrite the original file. We can also look at virtualsky.js as instructed, but you can leave that one alone for now. All right, we can't forget the other changes we need to complete. Let's go back into our web UI and edit the config.sh file as well. We need to set the image upload to true. We also need to change upload video, upload keygram, and upload star trails to true as well. Then we'll also set post end of night data to true. I'm not gonna dig into everything in here, but you should take some time to read through it. Okay, click save changes, then click to confirm. Now change the editor to look at the ftp-settings.sh file. In our case, the protocol, we're gonna set it to local. If you're sending this to an internet-facing website, like I do at my patriotastro.com hosted site, you'll need to set it up differently based on the access required to post to that hosted service. Make sure you set the image directory, videos directory, keygrams directory, and star trails directory folders as instructed earlier. You'll need to complete more of this form if sending data off box. Of course, when done, save the file. I'm gonna go ahead and stop and then start the AllSky service just to show that you can do that and to get it running again clean after all of our changes. When it comes back, I'll click on Live View and it says the AllSky service is starting up. Let's talk quickly about a very helpful command you'll need if you run into issues along the way. From the command line, type tail-f slash var slash log slash allsky.log. Well, hey, look at that. This log is telling me that some of the images are bad and it's not gonna display them. Why? Well, it says that it's saving a night image, but I'm inside and it's taking pictures of a bright ceiling. It thinks something's wrong and it doesn't wanna save those pictures. You can learn a lot from this log file if you have issues, so use this command. I mean, please use this command. Another thing it says here is that removebadimages.sh is triggering. Going back to the web page, there was a suggestion to temporarily change removebadimages to false in config.sh. Let's do that in the web UI editor. Give it a second to restart all sky, and now I can see pictures. I can see all the saved photos in the images menu as well. I don't wanna leave it like this in the long term, but I can sort out any problems and then tell it to remove bad images later once I got it sorted out and it's running with the right locale, the right latitude and longitude, and it's appropriately set up outside looking at the night sky. Okay, now that I have everything installed and have images coming in, let me show you how to view the AllSky website we just installed. In a browser, go to the name of the pie slash AllSky. See, like the public PHP, but better. I won't dig into this too much here. You can play around with things like the overlay if you like, and also once you have at least one night of data, you'll be able to view and download time lapses, keygrams, and star trail images. Let's look at my public website and see my two temporary cameras I have occasionally sending data out there. This top one is a ZWO camera installation, and the bottom one uses a Pi HQ camera. I'm experimenting with a couple different lenses, so they look a bit different. I can view saved time lapses and even download them directly from here off the internet. And I guess since I made them public, so can you. So what would be the next steps for you? Well, getting a focused image and manipulating the various settings to ensure you're getting pictures you want of the night sky. 
Take your time and enjoy the process. There may be some frustration along the way, but that makes the reward that much more valuable. All right, that's it for today. If you're interested in setting one of these cameras up, check the description of this video for hardware suggestions. Head over to the AllSky website for software instructions and get started. Reach out to me if you have any questions, but be sure to check the AllSky page, the AllSky discussions forum, issues, and wiki as well, as that will be your best up-to-date source of information. Hope you enjoyed the video. Feel free to check out my other videos on YouTube, my astrophotography that I post on Instagram, and of course, my website at www.patriotastro.com. Have fun with this project, and of course, clear skies.